This is EP Reports, a vodcast from editor and publisher magazine, the authoritative voice of news media since 1884. Serving newspapers, broadcast, digital, and all forms of news publishing. And greetings once again, Mike Blinder, publisher, ENP Magazine. If you are listening to this program on a podcast platform that you prefer, God, I love alliteration. Please follow us watching on YouTube. There is a subscribe button below, bell to the right. Do something with those puppies. Hit them, smash them, click them, and you'll get an update each and every time we upload a new episode of this weekly vodcast series dedicated to the broadcasting and news publishing and print and all the various media out there that makes news industry emp reports tom how was that for an opening you know it, it was brilliant mike uh, I, I i have to remind everybody when i first moved out of newsrooms and onto the business side uh your work that you were doing with peter at the time was required reading my bosses made me do it so if this is <laughs> repaying you in even a tiny fraction for what i owe from all those years ago oh happy man to have- I just have to do that opening every time, so I always just try to mix it up a little. Tom Davidson is a very interesting person. We should have interviewed you years ago in this program because you started with ink in your veins at the Quad City Times. I've been stalking you in 1984. You don't look that old. Yeah, so you well, started I, I as a reporter. All this great. Right. I mean, you're from and you're from Iowa, the, the Midwest, right? Yep. Okay, there you go. So you, you're like you're America in one guy, but then you like me were a nerd. I mean, it doesn't say this in your LinkedIn profile, but remember, I I have my Toshiba laptop with the floppy drives in my office. I was carrying around as as president of the Maine Broadcast Association when the Portland Press Herald said, hey, you're a nerd. Help us start a newspaper online. Was this you? Were you always kind of digital in your background, sir? I remember building my first spreadsheet for campaign uh, contributions uh, when I was a state house reporter for Lee for the Quad City Times and their sister papers in Iowa, remember building that spreadsheet on a Radio Shack Trash 80 sitting uh, in the uh, press of- room in the basement of the Iowa Capitol, which used to be the horse stables at the Iowa Capitol. There's a message in there somewhere. And, so, and it- yeah, I, I, I've always been fascinated by what technology can do. Um, Really, my transition to the digital side of things happened in earnest when I lucked into a Knight Fellowship in the late 90s. That's right, 1998, you were a Knight yeah. Fellow. Then, it, you spent, then you spent some time at Tribune. I, I, I worked 22 years at Tribune Company, first as a reporter and then city editor for their Sun Sentinel down in Florida, did my Knight Fellowship. And then in, I think my fellowship pitch was something along the lines of, you know, I want to figure out how these, this digital technology affects us in the newsroom so we can be better at, at producing and distributing news. In a year in Silicon Valley, especially at the height of the internet bubble, it's like, oh, screw going back to the newsroom, get me in the ball game, coach. And was lucky enough to have bosses like Tim Landon who, uh, who let me move on to the business side. Oh, good. I worked for Tim at the Chicago Sun-Times for a while as one yeah. of my, as, what, as my, uh, uh, it was fun. No, that was that era there. Uh, but also now here, Gannett, Director of New Product Development, back in 2016 to 2020. So you there were in the, the real interesting years where all the new stuff was starting to emerge and everybody's watching Burrell reports and, and shifting every other month into the next, am I right? I mean, uh, Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it was a fascinating time. We built some cool things, some of which saw the light of day, some of which didn't. That's the nature of new product development. You know, even in my time in public media, where I spent seven years uh, in the in the early teens, you know, it's just fascinating to watch legacy industries try to adapt to these rapidly changing circumstances, to the utter upending of their business models, and watch independent sites, nonprofit and for profit alike, saying, you know, there's. There's no barrier to entry anymore. We don't need a $200 million printing plant to do local news. We don't need God and the FCC to give us a broadcast license. We can just set up a website and go. Um, it's it, It's been a wonderful ride, you know, being a storyteller, a journalist, but also a business leader at this time of incredible change in our industries. Boy, you just said a cotton pick and mouthful. We're going to unpack all of that on the backside of this message. This episode of ENP Reports is exclusively sponsored by Blocks Digital, formerly Town News. Even though the name has changed, their commitment to the media industry is as strong as ever. 
Blox Digital is now even better positioned to deliver integrated solutions like content management, audience development, advertising revenue, video management, and more. Join the over 2,000 news publishers worldwide that power their ongoing digital transformation with Blox Digital. Serving over 141 million monthly users who view over 6.5 billion pages of content each year. You can trust Blox Digital to empower you to connect you at scale with the community you need to reach. Blox Digital, formerly Town News, now reimagined to help meet the news publishing challenges of tomorrow and beyond. Learn more at BloxDigital.com. All right. So, Tom, I had a show. You may have seen it. You may not. Where this organization came out of nowhere called the Alliance for Sustainable Local News. Basically, it was it was six guys who are like I called them disruptors. You know them, don't you? Uh, Larry mm -hmm. Rickman of the Colorado Sun, Eric Barnes, Daily Memphian, David Summers, uh, publisher of the Long Beach Poach, my good friend Ken Doctor, and an Imtiaz Patel. Then he was with the Baltimore Banner. Now he's yep. going to the dark side, back to Gannett. And these guys formed an organization for. Pretty much everything you said in the in in the in the, the the top segment of this program that they basically said on the show, and I want to get your opinion of this, is nonprofit is just a word you use to do your bookkeeping. Yes, it's my my friend Mark Potts has always said nonprofit ain't nothing but a tax status, and he's right. Exactly, exactly. And it was David Summers who, and he didn't make this up, but he said the pull quote: um, "No margin, no mission." Do you agree? I mean, that's oh. oh. Oh, abs absolutely. I think what's interesting about all those organizations that, that you cited is, in a big picture sense, they are pursuing the same model that nonprofit digital startups are pursuing. They're pursuing the same model that public media organizations have pursued successfully for more than 50 years. And the notion is, we're going to get most of our revenue from the audience. I think what's interesting about that subgroup, the Baltimore Banner, the Memphian, the Colorado Sun, although they just switched to nonprofit status, is they were saying, we're going to do this through subscriptions, classic subscriptions versus more of the public media nonprofit model of what I like to call grandmotherly guilt. You know, exactly. build a big audience and then a couple times a year, you know, whip out grandma and, and wag fingers and nag people to give money. What? Fundamentally, while there's a different approach there, subscription versus donation, it's still the same business, which is pour an audience into the top of an acquisition funnel, and then one way or another, get that audience to give you money. Could not agree more. Um, I was a DJ before I got into sales because I wasn't that talented, but I went to Maine as a morning man program director for a group of radio stations in Portland. And I had a popular morning show. So public television used to bring me in on the Peter, Paul and Mary nights. Do you know what I mean? Yep, this yep, era? Yep. And I was a salesman. I wrote a book about sales in 2000. Sales is nothing more than fear of loss. That's it. That's why we call it the solution based sales process, based sales process. And I would, I made this an experiment. I could look at the camera phones behind me. Right. And just, guilt the hell out of that audience yeah. to make the phones. What would your world be like without Sesame Street? We don't get $1 from that cable company. We're here to serve you. Phones are ringing off the hook out of guilt. Why didn't the newspaper industry do that for 200 years and remind people of this Madisonian dictated necessity in our constitution? Why did we get so fat and lazy that we didn't do what public television does, which is brand it better? Do you agree? Yeah, well, yes and no. For a long time, we did. When you when you look back at the economics of, of legacy print, daily newspapers, in the 30s and 40s, three, four, five newspapers in any given town, and the money was split roughly half and half between subscription and circulation revenue and advertising revenue. Which was mostly but, classifieds, but go ahead, yes. Yeah, yeah. Right. And as as the industry shrunk and consolidated with the rise of television in the 50s, more traffic, making it just harder to get evening newspapers in particular out to people in time. And all of a sudden you had the rise of this one newspaper town, maybe two. The revenue mix started shifting. And all of a sudden it became much more compelling to say, 
we've got every car dealer in town who has to advertise with us on Sunday or on Saturday, rather. And we've got every department store who's advertising with us Saturday and Sunday and all of the and help wanted on Sunday. All of these basically monopolies of certain ad businesses. And it became much more compelling for a newspaper to say, let's keep circulation costs low to drive up circulation, drive up our rate base so we can charge more for the advertisers who have no choice. It was a monopoly and scarcity play. So really you saw the revenues, 60s, 70s, all through the 80s, shift to the point where when I was working in South Florida, hyper competitive market with the Sun Sentinel, the Miami Herald, the Palm Beach Post, all just bashing each other editorially. And it was fun and it was great. But economically, all of them were like, we want to get as much circulation as we can to drive up the rate base. So we'll give the paper away $1 for 13 weeks. And there were all these readers who would switch papers every 13 weeks to right. get this ridiculously low price. We literally could not afford to print and distribute the Sun Sentinel for the amount of money that was coming in the door on circulation. And we didn't care because we were making 400 bucks a year off of every new subscriber we got in ad revenue. Right, let's talk about you. You have this amazingly interesting intertwined background. I don't I think there's anyone job, else. In other words, I don't know if there's anyone else <laughs> like you. See, I've been exploring the nonprofit, no, excuse me, the public broadcasting world lately, because my goal at ENP, I have this 142 year old brand, is to just appeal to three bullets. It's on my desk, and we live for it. Someone who publishes journalism some way, shape, form, or size, someone who has to build an audience for that journalism and someone who has to monetize it. And when you go beyond the online-only news sites and the legacy print you know, partners out there, the, one of the few broadcast spaces left for local news is public radio. Yeah. And, and, and I've been exploring it more and more and chatting with some of the leaders in that industry, and I'm finding that there is two different types of people, some living in the past, and then some that are coming from, God forbid, the business side to change that culture. You have both sides. So you came from legacy media, and now you're an advocate, consultant, leader in the public broadcasting world. What is this all about, and why are you there? Or is this all one kind of media now? Give me your you know. I was attracted to public media in particular uh, after Tribune went through its troubles and its bankruptcy as I left there in 2009, landed at, at first at PBS in 2010. And PBS's president then and now uh, is the absolutely brilliant, uh, an American treasure, Paula Kerger. And as part of Paula's standard stump speech, anytime she's out talking to the public, she'll probably use some variation of this line. When you work for Main Street rather than Wall Street, you get to make different choices. And the first time I heard that, sitting in some staff meeting, it was like clouds parting. Because especially after Tribune, when it was going through the financial collapse of the Great Recession, you know, carrying $13 billion worth of debt, everything was about grinding out as much money every quarter as you could to just try to hold the wolves at bay. Being in an environment where it's like, we have a different business model. We get to approach this differently. That was utterly refreshing. You're right. There are two distinct camps in the broad world of public media right now. The reality is most journalism is produced by public radio stations, not public television stations. So for we'll now. Talk specifically about, for now. We'll talk for specifically now. about radio. Right. There are people who, just as we saw in the commercial world, who love radio who just have this intimate relationship with that box sitting on their nightstand or sitting in the center console of their car. And they think of it primarily as linear, real-time audio above all things. Much like you and I worked with plenty of people who just, you'd see them, they'd run down to the press room and they'd get the first copies off the press and they'd smell the ink. There we're in love with The rumble with of print. the floor. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Versus people who are like, I really like serving my community. I like telling stories. I like distributing information. Radio is a wonderful way to do that, but we have lots of other ways to do exactly. that too. And 
Exactly. You know, the reality of public broadcasting right now, and this is causing a lot of fretting among friends and colleagues of mine, is, you know, the dirty secret of, of public television is its audience is age 65 plus. And, and they're white, women, and wealthy. And it's suburbs. a wonderful audience if you want to sell them a DVD of that Peter, Paul, and Mary special, and that's how you're right. making your money. But it's a difficult, it's a tough putt to look out 10 years and say, where are we with that audience? Well, see, Radio come... is a little younger, but not much. So, so that audience challenge, how do we serve our communities beyond just the 5 to 10% of the people who are white, wealthy, and suburban and old? That's the real rub of public media right now. Well, let's let's analyze that. We had Juana Summers on this program. Yeah. And she was completely, totally candid about why she got the job and what her mission was. I mean, she didn't. It was amazing. She said, we're changing our culture. It's, and it's a hard shift. Mm -hmm. You see, now I look at things. Who else did we have on this program? One of my favorite stories that we uncovered here at ENP is we had Jennifer Coe on this program when she was hired by the Chicago Sun-Times, then she reappeared nine months later when she was working for public media. Do you yeah. see when public brought, see, this is fascinating. In Chicago, they didn't pick up the, the stodgy tabloid. I mean, the stodgy broadsheet, they picked up the tabloid beer drinking, maybe we have a woman inside with a bikini brand and brought them together. Well, and in fact, that was very intentional. I know some of the folks who were involved in some of the behind the scenes discussion, they certainly didn't violate their NDAs, but the appeal of the Sun-Times to BEZ was Sun-Times has always been the paper that covered the city of Chicago. And, and the, the Tribune, even when I worked for yeah. a company, covered the North Shore, covered the suburbs. But the Sun-Times was about the city and all of its grittiness. And that BEZ really sees and continues to see an opportunity. We we have the white suburbanites already. Let's do a better job of serving the central community of the city of Chicago. But I, when I chatted with some of these leaders on a local level in the broad the public broadcasting world, and I'm not going to mention their names, although some of them wouldn't mind. I'm assuming some say when they have that old stodgy white suburban woman brand on their back, they say that's more of a hindrance when they're trying to re rebrand themselves locally. It, it can be. And, and what's been fascinating is, you know, public media, just like us in the old days of print of the 20th century, there's a certain herd mentality. And there are certain leaders, there are certain people who are who are dipping their toe in the water, uh, doing some things that, that some of their peers think are crazy. And then once it works, everybody sort of hops in. As a, an old business school professor of mine used to say, you never want to be the first seal in the water because there might be a shark down there, but you want to be the second seal in the water because you're going to get more fish. Uh, it's interesting to watch experiments like when uh, the public radio stations in New York, Washington, and Los Angeles bought the assets of the uh, Gothamist, DCist, LAist brands. And in different ways, tried to take more of that digital edgier brand into their organization. One of my favorite experiments is down in Jacksonville where David McGowan, mm -hmm. longtime public media executive, but he, he was named a general manager and CEO of a WJCT. He went out and raised more than a million dollars to expand his newsroom. And he didn't do it by hiring radio reporters. He set up a separate brand, Jack's Today, packed it with a bunch of old newspaper folks, produced sort of the classic exactly. digital startup newsroom, and then reverse fed the best of that stuff onto radio. But his point was, if we if we do this as a radio first approach, maybe we grow our audience from reaching 5% of the people in the Jacksonville metro area to 7%. Woohoo! His attitude was, let's go out and, and, and try to reach 20, 30, 50% through this digital endpoint while still serving our classic radio audience. It's a mind shift that's going to be fascinating to watch play out because lots of places are, are looking at that and thinking about it. The most forward-thinking boards, because most of these are, are community licensees owned by a community nonprofit. They're starting to look at this and saying, why is it that a site like VT Digger in Vermont is the largest newsroom in the state? Why aren't we as a public media organization the largest newsroom in our, in our community? Well, you know, I it's brands. I mean, what, I have yeah. had more people give me advice on. I my biggest challenge at ENP is what it stands for. Yeah, 
uh, editor and publisher. I'm not editor and pu I'm editor, publisher, ad director, digital manager, audience development manager. So I mean, I could go on and on. I mean, I'm like, I feel like I'm KFC where I've got to bury the word fried, right? Yeah, so, yeah. But but you can polish old brands. That's the speech I'm doing at all out of state associations now, where you put it in the center. You see, you're proud of your legacy, but then you put like the Disney years still exist, right? <laughs> but it's just yeah. surrounded with really cool interest. We can go on and on. I want to get to one other topic, and this is important. You wrote an op-ed that got a lot of play, and you you published it in The Current. Uh, it was just a few months ago in the fall, right? Where you yep. kind of lectured the public television industry that they weren't in the right space to get to the philanthropic money. By the way, I had a hell of a time getting to it because the paywall was kind of wonky. You might want to mention it to them. <laughs> but I finally got the text of that thing, and I was fascinated. And then a few months later, on your own blog, right? You got your own little site. You started talking about how some of that's resonating now. Talk to me about why you felt compelled to tell an industry that they're behind the times when it comes to go for filling. I mean, you're the one that just said it's all about guilt and getting money, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some of that is because many public media organizations are quite good at getting those small dollar memberships. Of course. Nag people on the air, play grandmotherly guilt, get them to give you five bucks a month, 10 bucks a month, 15 bucks a month. But that's a different form of fundraising than the money that's really pouring into local journalism right now, which is philanthropic, especially foundation money. Exactly. Institutional foundations, Knight, MacArthur, Lumina, Joyce, the list goes on. They can't be guilted. They're very sophisticated in how they spend their money. Whereas the membership fundraising model is built on reach. Or in a big audience at the top, get 10% of that audience to give you money. The foundation fundraising model is built on relevance and results. Foundations want to change the world. They want to fix a problem. And you have to show how your work helps them fix that problem. Why? Folks like <clears throat> Jim Brady at Knight Foundation, uh, Casey Adiero at uh, Joyce in Chicago, they used to do my job. They were reporters. They were editors. They were business leaders. They can't be bamboozled. And they know that classic public media organizations serve 5% of the audience that's wealthy, old, white, and suburban. And they're like, why would I want to dramatically increase funding if my job is to fix the local news desert in place X? That public media organization has to convince me that they can do that in a meaningful way. I, had, I talked to one public radio general manager. I think I had a line in one of my first op-eds that say, you know, these foundation leaders, they're saying polite things in public, but behind their things, they're saying, don't bring me a proposal that goes like, well, I have five radio reporters now when we produce 12 packages a week with your help and a million dollars, I can grow that to nine reporters producing 20 packages a week that serve five to 10% of my market. That's go. a non-starter. And I had a radio general manager argue with me but my work is important it's like you're still me reaching just the tiniest single digit fraction of your market the knight foundation joyce luma they're not interested in that they're in and especially when they look at nonprofits like vt digger and some of the other stars that have been at it for a while that are literally reaching half of their market every month who do you fund five percent or fifty percent it's pretty straightforward so you're pretty much the, the fly in the suit. Oh, uh, you know, uh, in, in all my favorite characters of mythology, I love Cassandra the most because, you know, just just screaming truth to power. Well, and, and maybe that's what public broadcasting needs is a little uh, Cassandra in their life right now? Because I don't see it coming from anywhere else. Well, there, there are folks like there out there. I mean, I cited uh, David McGowan at Jacksonville, Rich Homburg uh, at Detroit, Deanna Mackey and her predecessor, Tom Carlo at KPBS uh, in San Diego, who've built this multimedia local journalism powerhouse. What's interesting to me is, is seeing as you know, there's a wave of retirements every year in public media at the end of the calendar year, uh, as people try to set up their predecessor to start at the beginning of the fiscal year in July. And watching some of the 
job postings for some of these positions. It's interesting to see more and more of them talking about entrepreneurial attitude, publishing on platforms other than just radio and or television. So there's a shift that's beginning to happen. There are still enormously conservative change averse organizations out there uh just as there were and you know in our days of print and just as you see in legacy Still broadcast watching. journalism but it's starting to change well i've said this on the program a few times one of my favorite my quotes if i may not from mythology uh how many psychiatrists does it take to change a light bulb only yes. one but the light bulb has to want to change yeah i've stolen <laughs> that line <laughs> well tom Tom Davidson, you have many ways people can connect with you, but my favorite is your blog. And that's at what? You own Tom DGDavidson.com. You were like me. I got Mike Blinder and Mike Lawrence, my stage name, way back in the old days. I got the, uh, if you go to MikeLawrence.com, which was my stage, because I'm Michael Lawrence Blinder, you will see all my radio and TV stuff in my past when I had a stage, when I used that as my as my name. But anyway, it's an honor to have you on the program. We're going to tap you more and more. You don't know this yet, my editorial team, on what the heck's going on and and get your view at 30,000 feet of what's going on with that transformation, which is so essential in maintaining local journalism. Tom, thanks so much for being on the program. It's a pleasure. These are fascinating times in local journalism. I feel privileged to have a chance to, to influence it, even in a tiny way. Thanks, Mike.